Hi, I'm Melissa Jeanette Shea, President and CEO of the Long Island Real Estate Investors Association. Almost two decades ago, on Adair, I purchased my first home with no money down. I received $7,000 at the closing and earned $200 a month in passive income, all while my tenant was paying the mortgage. Since then, we've purchased over $30 million in real estate and have taught people just like you how to do the same. Visit us at the Meeting of the Minds Podcast.com. Register and receive our free ebook that explains how to get the money to begin investing in real estate. So, if you've always wanted to own real estate and don't know how, you need to contact us. We're local, accessible, and we work with you personally to ensure that you become the most successful real estate investor that you can be. Whether your goals are to fix and flip or income generation through portfolio building, visit us at the Meeting of the Minds Podcast.com. Join our monthly workshops and learn the secrets to real estate investing success. Don't forget to register at the Meeting of the Minds Podcast to receive our free ebook where you can learn how to get the money to begin real estate investing. And for even more amazing educational content, join us here every week on the Meeting of the Minds Podcast. Get out of the rat race and learn how to invest in real estate today. Hey guys, you're listening to the Meeting of the Minds podcast. If you've always wanted to learn how you could become financially independent through real estate investing but aren't sure where to begin, then you're listening to the right show because that's what we teach. Go to our website, themeetingofthemindspodcast.com, register, and we'll send you an ebook that'll explain to you how you can get the money to begin investing in real estate. You'll also receive email notifications about all of our upcoming events and much more. Be sure to follow us and turn on all notifications so that you do get notified when we upload new content, which is once, sometimes up to three times a week. Now, with that being said, let's get into today's episode. If this is your first time listening in, my name is John Shea, and sitting across from me is the love of my life, the milk to my chocolate, the kibble to my bits, my wife, <laughs> Melissa J. Shea. Today, we're going to be discussing the philosophy of money, but first, Melissa is going to tell you a little bit about how she got started in real estate investing. <laughs> And every episode, he always gets me with an introduction. So, I sure do. Oh, uh, yeah, that's really good. So, um, yes, how did I get started? So, if this is the first time you're listening, getting into real estate investing is very hard to do because you don't know where the entry part is. Sometimes you guys watch HGTV and you think the first way into getting into real estate investing is buying a house, renovate it, and flip it. And I'll tell you that that's the most riskiest part of the business, but um, most people just don't know how to start. So, and it's also the fun part of the business. So, um, but that's not how I started. I started from an infomercial, um, Carlton Sheets, back in the day, if people are old enough to remember him. He was an amazing man. I got to meet him several times. Uh, he was very tall. But what he taught me was um, his book was uh, OPM, Using Other People's Money with No Money Down to Buy Real Estate. So obviously his caption attracted me. I got into buying holds, but I quickly ran out of money. And so I did get into the fix and flip. And from there, uh, the first year I bought six properties. The second year I bought 11 properties. By the time I was five years into it, I had 360 units. Then subsequently lost them all and had to learn how to really be a real estate investor in 2010. That's when I met you, and we built what we have today. So that's how I got started. Always I, always an inspiring story. I never get sick of hearing it. <laughs> I try to tell it different every time, though. This one was the short version, actually, though. Yeah, I was trying to do the short version. But, well, you know what? I, I do want listeners to know that I did do that when I was a single mom. So at, I had... Um, you know, I had three babies at one point and uh, doing this. So I just want to let people know that it doesn't matter what's going on in their life. They can start real estate investing. I've seen young ones in their early 20s all the way to people in their late 60s doing real estate investing, just starting real estate investing. Okay. So you, you talk a lot about the philosophy of money. Yes. What books did you read and which ones can you recommend to listeners that taught you the, quote, philosophy of money, unquote? So yes, it's really important that you learn the philosophy of money. I think the biggest failure school districts or schools do today is not teach the most fundamental thing that they need to learn when they get out of school, which is the philosophy of money. They don't know how to manage their money. They don't know how to um, save their money. They don't know how to invest their money because they don't know how money works. But so, they do teach you the anatomy of a dinosaur. <laughs> that they do. <laughs> uh, that comes from me uh, 
learning that the hard way. All right, so let's tell that little side story real quick before okay, we get yeah, into it. Yeah, yeah. So when the pandemic hit, we all became instant teachers because our children were being homeschooled. And John and I have eight children. Yes, ridiculously, eight children. So eight children, a pandemic, and eight businesses at the same time was a little overwhelming. And it, we ha- you got to remind people it's a blended family. Yes, We're not yes, like yes. sick and twisted in the head. Yeah, yeah. He had three, I had three, and together we had two. Um, so with that being said, and we also have three special needs. So uh, an abrupt change to that and their schedule and an erotic dog and a neurotic dog um, was a little overwhelming in our household. Plus, they had rations, so we would have to go to the store twice as much because they would limit, you know, two items, and yet we have a huge family. Um, so it was a little uh, hectic, and then the teacher sends home homework, and then, you know, they're repeatedly calling you, saying your children are not doing their work. And I said, oh, God, what's the lesson plan? And he said, the anatomy of dinosaur. And I think I just lost it on the poor teacher. And I'm like, are you kidding me? There's a pandemic going on. My children all, you know, I'm going ranting and raving. They've never heard of the Spanish flu or, you know, any of that stuff. They don't know (laughs) how to balance a checkbook. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to teach them basic things in life they know nothing of. But I'm supposed to teach them the anatomy of a dinosaur that died, what, 50 million years ago? So I kind of lost it. And then... Like two months later, I got my little god smack when my little five-year, right, our five-year-old, <laughs> all he wants to know is about a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, all he, all he does is watch dinosaur shows, documentaries. So we're going to have a paleontologist in the family, and he just so happens to need to know the anatomy of a dinosaur. Yeah, but he still needs to know about money. <clears throat> so that's where it kind of leads to is uh, the philosophy of money, right? So the philosophy of money is this. Um, I learned it when I lost everything, right? Um, it was kind of easy to start real estate investing at the time that I started, simply because at the time we could get 100%, 106% financing. Reason why it was 106, it would cover the closing costs. So it was quite easy to get into properties, but I made a lot of risky decisions that I had to learn my lesson the hard way when I lost everything. And so I started doing research, and the first book I read was uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. And The Richest Man in Babylon was built, uh, written in the early 1900s, I think late 1800s. It's a, literally, it's probably about a 20-minute read. It's a fable about how The Richest Man in Babylon got started. But there was two really important lessons that I learned from that, and one is um, that you take 10% of your money and tithe it or give it to charity. Um, there's a law in the universe, what you give is what you get. So by uh, giving 10%, that was a big philosophy. Second was you had to pay yourself first. And paying yourself first meant you took 10% of whatever you earned and you invested that and you saved it up till you could buy an investment. So I started doing that and the philosophy, especially as a business owner, is very hard to pay yourself first. But if you don't pay yourself first, you starve yourself and you get worn out very quickly. But if you're getting compensated well, you have the desire to make your business better so that you can keep earning money and you help your employees. So it's really important that you pay yourself first. Then, so let's uh, give credit to where it is. Um, if you guys want to pick that book up, that's written by George Gleason. Correct. Yeah, it's The Richest Man in Babylon, George Gle- Gleason. I mean, you can even YouTube it, but I would tell you um, if you can get the book and just read it, it's literally like a 20 minute read. I'm, I'm not a, a, you know, we don't have time in our household to actually read a book. If not, our dog will eat it. But um, really, The Richest Man in Babylon by George Gleason. Read that one. That's the first way it started. But you could probably get it like on Audible and listen oh, to yeah, it. Oh, yeah. Know. Audible, yeah. Now, all my books are on Audible now. You know, I think we should do a, uh, a podcast where you read that 20-minute read. <laughs> yeah. You should do it. You have a much better voice for a yeah. radio. Um, so anyway, this, the second book, which is, was a follow-up to that, was The Revised Rich, Richest Man in Babylon by Jim um, Rowan and he is an amazing man he taught the philosophy of money and his story is pretty unique because he would tell how he was from he was 25 he had a young family um, and his mentor was WC Clemens who started a combined life insurance policy started from nothing his mentor was Napoleon Hill the man who wrote think and grow rich so it's kind of interesting how that came down and Jim Rowan was um, 
really a dynamic speaker. If you can get any of his Audible books or listen to some of his YouTube videos, he's since passed, but um, he left a legacy to help people understand the philosophy of money. Uh, his student or apprentice was Tony Robbins, so it's kind of interesting how he, uh, Tony Robbins of, uh, attributes a lot of what he learned to Jim Rowan. So Jim Rowan kind of did this philosophy. He took the richest man in Babylon and added a layer into it. So he said, take 10%, tithe it, and charity, or again, you know, you give what you get, and you get what you give, I'm sorry, <laughs> and then 10% to active investments. So that would be investing in something like a, a business or a stock or something like that. And then he said 10% for a passive investment. So um, that would be, be where somebody else manages your money, okay? So it was these three buckets that he talked about so that you'd live on 70% of your income and have that pay all your expenses and then have these three buckets of 10% to charity, 10% to active investing, and 10% um, to passive investment. And it was a great philosophy, and uh, we, we work with that philosophy today, and it really does help. It helps when you, especially when you have rainier days, um, those three buckets really help out. Okay, and there was a third book, I believe, right? And then the third book that I had was a book that had changed a lot of people's lives. It was an aha book written in 1997, and that is um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So that changed the whole philosophy of looking at how expenses, or what we view assets, what we view out, uh, liabilities, how we look at how to get out of the rat race. Unfortunately, that philosophy of, you know, go to school, get good grades, get into college, um, get a good stable job with benefits we has proven over time it, it's broken it doesn't work I see all these younger kids coming out with huge debt on their head all they're doing is paying off their schooling for the next 20 30 years and they don't start living there is no guarantee that they will get a job there's no guarantee that they'll love the job that they're in and so I think parents really need to take the pressure off children that they have to go to college if they don't know what they want to do, don't encourage them to get into debt. I mean, if they're going to get into debt, get them into good debt, you know, help them buy a house or something like that. Um, I think you do your children a great injustice if you push them into a higher education without them really wanting that higher education and having a goal at the end, you know, uh, just to go to college just for the sake of going to college. That's just uh, fruitless. So, um yeah, that, philosophy, that book definitely changed my mind. It was um, How to Get Out of the Rat Race. So it talked about the E quadrant. They have, you have an employee status. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Oh, okay. So, yeah. good. The E quadrant. That was pretty enlightening and a big aha book. So if you haven't read it, definitely read it. If you have read it, he subsequently has come out with a whole bunch of different books. But I encourage rereading that every few years because um, you mature and there's some really good principles in there. All right. So you guys heard it. There's three books, The Richest Man in Babylon by George Gleason, The Richest Man in Babylon Revised by Jim Rowan, and Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which Melissa didn't say his name, but Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, sorry. He wrote that book. <laughs> I just assumed everybody knew. <laughs> okay. And you started touching on it a little bit, but uh, how do you recommend dividing people's income based on the content that you read in these books? So... Again, it goes back to that 70-30 rule, right? So if you can take 10% um, and give it to uh, something you truly believe in, you know, there's expression, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. So um, whatever it is, and whether you believe in God or not, um, do something you feel passionate about, cheerful about. Um, something that's near and dear to us is Charity Water. I really love his story, him, his wife, and his children, and what he's done. And you and I have made a lot of contributions to that because I think everybody deserves the right to have clean water in the rest of the world, and it, it does prevent so much of the illness. So um, that's something we enjoy doing. I know you're pretty passionate about um, the military, men in military. Like, right. Um, yeah, you're very passionate about that. So he always contributes to um, military families or anything that um, – something like that. I, who, what was that gentleman that we talked about? Oh, oh um, 
the Blaine, Mr. Blaine's. It, it, <sighs> if you guys get a chance, you can look up uh, Mr. Ballen, B A L L E N. He's an ex uh, Navy, Navy SEAL, Seal. who uh, is from Massachusetts, I believe, and he does like dark and mysterious stories. And he tells some really good uh, military stories about uh, their successes and. Yeah, so there was one in particular that you really felt passionate about. So we make sure that we do that. So again... um, I'll find out that guy's name and I'll make sure that I say it on the next podcast so you guys could research him. Yeah, it's pretty amazing But it's basically another Navy SEAL who, uh, when his time came up to re-enlist, he decided not to, sold all of his possessions and moved to Iraq. It was Iraq or Afghanistan? uh, To help the civilians. Yeah, um, casualties of war. You know that. They yeah, were so he he joined this this group of militia, and they go around and they try to rescue civilians out of war zones. And yeah, uh, pretty. I'll powerful. find out that information. I'll get that to you guys. Yeah. So he. So you enjoy donating to that. Then the second part is, um, we. So our bucket of active investing is real estate investing, right? So we take ten percent. We take more than ten percent, actually. We take probably closer to thirty percent of our income and put it into active investments, and that is our businesses and real estate holdings. And then we take 10% of that and we put it into a savings that we have um, Roy Flager manage for us. So he does our um, portfolio of uh, financial advisor. So he helps out. So there's our three buckets. And then we live off the 70% of our expenses. And so that's a good philosophy. It's worked really well for us over the last 11 years that we've been together. And so I highly recommend that. Okay, so we have our first emailed in question, but first, I want to tell you guys about RVP2 Consulting. They're a financial services consulting firm founded by Melissa and I's personal friend, Mr. Roy Flager. These guys aim to break the bounds of the traditional financial service experience. RVP2 Consulting specializes in providing fiduciary level guidance to American working families, business owners, and more importantly, real estate investors. From retirement planning to 1031 exchanges, they have access to hundreds of investment products that they will tailor specifically to your needs and goals. They offer a full suite of personalized financial planning services that puts planning your goals over the selection of investment products. You could schedule a free consultation by calling 631-937-3475 or by visiting their website at www.rvpii consulting.com securities offered through dai securities llc a member of finra and sipc advisory services offered through dai wealth inc an sec registered investment advisor dai securities llc and dai wealth inc are separate but affiliated entities and with that let's get into the first emailed in question so ricky from patchog new york asked Melissa, you speak about 1031 exchanges. Can you please explain the process so that a 25-year-old like myself can understand? Okay. So congratulations on being 25. So a 1031 exchange, just so you know, is when you can sell a piece of real estate. First, if you sell it for, say, $100,000, you'd have to buy another piece of real estate like exchange. So in other words, you'd buy one piece of real estate for another piece of real estate. That could be land, an apartment building, but it has to be at least $100,000 or more. The benefit to that is that you defer your capital gains. Now, in theory, you can defer those capital gains all the way until you pass on. So the, the reason why, once you get started in real estate, it's very addicting, is because 1031 exchanges allow you to defer all the capital gains, which now is about 20% on the federal level, but then you also have the state. So, uh, you know, in New York State, we're at, what, 8.35 or 7.5 or something like that. Whatever it is, it's nearly 30% that you'd have to pay in taxes. Now, if you could take that 30% and reinvest it into property where you continue to get cash flow, that's a way that you can scale quite quickly using a 1031 exchange. Now, the 1031 exchange is actually the number of the tax code, so that's all it is. But um, the point is, is that you can never take access to that money. It has to go to an intermediary, a qualified intermediary. Intermediary. That's a they call it QI for abbreviation because they have to have acronyms for everything. 
But the real part is, is that you sell one piece of property to buy another piece of property using a third party, and that way you can defer your gains um, and pay less taxes. Excellent, great. And I, uh, I, w- I was a little naughty and I used my phone while Melissa was just <laughs> saying that to find out that gentleman's name. His name is Ephraim Matos, E-P-H-R-A-I-M. Matos, M-A-T-T-O-S. And his organization, you guys can look up, is called strongholdrescue.org. Yeah, so I was. it was really powerful because he was able to save a little girl and um, from a horrific um, gun battle between uh, ISIS and... And, um, and they just so happen to have the whole thing, the whole rescue operation recorded. This guy's getting shot in the leg. He's holding this little girl. It, it was It's an amazing story. Yeah, it's amazing. Sorry. And you know what it is? It's not about war or supporting war efforts. It's about saving those that are affected by war. So I thought that was pretty touching. But that's enough on that. So let's get right back into this. Here we go. Question number three. What is the difference between an asset and a liability? Okay. So according to Robert Kiyosaki, he gives the simplest, basic, and accurate, in my opinion, uh, meaning of what an asset and a liability is. So an asset is simply something that puts money in your pocket, and a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. When you go to a bank to apply for a loan or a mortgage, they'll ask you what assets are and liabilities. In their mind, your home is an asset, and while you may have equity in your home, truly, it's not an asset, because even if it was paid in full and you had no mortgage on it, you would still be liable for the taxes, for the utilities, for the upkeep of that property. So we'll, we'll always take money out of your pocket. So it truly is a liability. The only time a house becomes a asset is if you have rental income to offset it. So if you are living in one part of the house and you have a tenant that's renting another part of the house and that tenant pays all the expenses of that house, then it truly becomes an asset. But Um, A liability is when it costs you money. So, again, using your house or your car. So children are liabilities. (laughs) Children are We have eight liabilities in the house. (laughs) They are very expensive habits, I call it. Um, Yes, because they don't produce any income. (laughs) Not yet, at least. And um, so, yeah, you want to be mindful of that. So if you've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he uses a terminology called doodads. These are boats, right? Unless you rent out your boat, um, it, be, it really is a big liability because it's always... Yeah, boat literally stands for break out another thousand. Yeah, in our case, it's always like that, right? So, But we enjoy it. And then the other part is like cars, things like that. So you may have a collectible car and you think that's an asset, but it, it again, it ties into the maintenance, the upkeep and all that. So those are the differences between an asset and a liability. Whatever puts money in your pocket is an asset. Whatever takes money out of your pocket is a liability. And they can switch back and forth. Excellent. So we got another email question from Rena in Calverton. She says, do you guys have any live events coming up? When, where, and how could I attend? Hi, Rena. And yes, we do. So September 8th is our first live event at the Huntington Hilton in Melville. And we're very excited to have... Um, a live event again i really we all really miss you guys so we can't wait to have it we have usually over you know pre-covid we have over 100 people there uh, it's a great place to network it's a great place to find some good quality education it's a great place to find some resources and um, access to professionals like uh, accountants uh, attorneys funding op- options and then also the opportunities to invest in deals. So we have different investment opportunities as well. Right. And again, that's the Long Island Real Estate Investors Association, dot com. But you can go to the Meeting of the Minds podcast.com, register. You'll get the free ebook that'll explain how to get the money to begin investing in real estate. You could also send us an email and we will give you a free guest pass for that event. If you don't do that, it's $50 to pay at the door. It is $25. Five or twenty nine dollars. If you, me and Sean had a little discussion about this the other day, and he seems to think it's twenty nine dollars if you pre register online. It's so probably. I'm, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> it's twenty nine dollars if you pre register online, fifty dollars at the door, or to become a member, which is probably the most intelligent thing to do. It's two hundred and twenty five dollars for the whole year, and that's as Melissa always says, less than one dollar a day. 
And with that, you get all the meetings included and some discounts on some education and opportunities to go on um, certain trips with us. Not to mention, you get to see our pretty faces. Yeah, that's yep. the fun part. So, okay, we're going to get into the last question now. Certainly not the, the least. And I actually gave you a pen because I know you're going to have to write this out in order to understand it a little bit. And a few folks at home, you could probably look it up online. But can you please explain exactly what the E-Quadrant is? In sock puppets and crayons format, so somebody like me can understand. Sure. So the E quadrant is where. Um, it's so I, I could tell. I could say what you're doing. She made a <laughs> a cross, and she put an E in the left side, an I on the right side at the top, and then the bottom two, uh, an S and a B. That's right. pretty good reading upside down, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So basically, um, it's actually B and then I. Sorry. She's going to have to explain it now. I already did it once. Okay. So basically it breaks it up into four squares. Okay. So you've got the employee, right, which is the highliest, they have the heaviest tax. And those are the people that work nine to five. So E stands for employee. Just below an E on the left side of the quadrant is the S. The S stands for self-employed. Basically... The difference between an employee and a self-employed person is somebody who's self-employed will work 80 hours to avoid working 40 hours for somebody else. Um, they still have a job. It's solely dependent on them. They pay less taxes and they have more write-offs. Um, and they also have more freedom of their time. So that is the progression. Usually you start off as an employee. You go to the bottom of that quadrant on the left-hand side, which is self-employed. And then from self-employed, you turn that into an actual business. And business is a larger corporation. Basically, the difference between those is if something happened to you, would the business survive? So if once the business is self-sufficient without you there, it's truly a business or a big business. So that's the B of the quadrant on the right-hand side. And underneath that is the I, the investors. Those are the ones that earn their living just from passive income from being an investor. So the goal is to get from the left side of the quadrant to the right side of the quadrant. And I don't know if I gave it enough description when they're listening. That's a very visual thing. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm saying. You guys could probably look it up online. Uh, the, yeah. The E quadrant. E quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. You'll see, like I said, it's a, it's a quadrant. It's like an X. Uh, it would, uh, what is it? The cross kind of thing. Yeah. And so on the left um, square, it's going to be an E. Underneath that is going to be the S. Then you have the B on the top right side. And on the bottom left side will be an I. And that's the goal. You want to be um, on the left side of the quadrant to get out of the rat race. Excellent. So unfortunately, guys, that's going to conclude today's show. Um, it's not the most exciting topic in the world, but all education is not supposed to be fun. Real estate investing is an excellent way to supplement your income, and it's available to everyone. Uh, education, of course, is the key to success. So go to the Meeting of the Minds Podcast.com, register, and receive our ebook that will explain to you how to get the money to begin investing in real estate today. Stop chasing the cheese and start making it for yourself because only then can you truly escape, escape the rat race. <laughs> Guys, from Melissa, myself, and all of our team, happy investing. <laughs>